Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration in Accra. The completion of the institute marks a milestone in Ghana's efforts to institutionalize a strong foundation in the diplomatic landscape. President Ekufu Addo in his keynote address indicated that Ghanaian diplomats do not only stand a chance of having opportunities to travel abroad, but would also benefit greatly from the essential training at home where former diplomats will have the right environment to share their knowledge and experiences. <laughs> You may recall that following a rationalization exercise by the government of the second president of the Fourth Republic, His Excellency President John Adekum Kufo, the first MPP president in 2006, the Ministry of Regional Cooperation and New Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPA, was merged with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs resulting in the creation of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, thus widening the scope of the Ministry's mandate to encompass and signal Ghana's commitment to regional and continental integration. Properties inherited by the new Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration from the defunct Minister of Regional Cooperation and Network including an uncompleted office building located on this very site. The Ministry of Diplomatic staff at the time traveled abroad for professional diplomatic training. Aside the academic training provided by the Legon, the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy, Lesia, and lately other institutions. Such training programs are more of practical and skills development with students from various countries sharing their unique experiences and worldview. Ghana needed also to position herself to provide similar training facilities at home to receive diplomats from other countries as they have been doing for the benefit of Ghanaians and other diplomats. Considering, therefore, that Ghana's diplomatic resource base needed dr drastic expansion as the country envisaged herself as the gateway to Africa, I had to take the necessary step to establish such an institute. The completion of the Foreign Service Institute thus marks an important milestone in Ghana's efforts to institutionalize a strong foundation for her diplomatic service. The Akufu Arab's government's commitment to fostering diplomacy, cultivating international relations, and equipping our diplomats with the necessary skills to navigate the complexities of the ever-changing global landscape is to be enhanced as we commission this edifice today. Ghanaian diplomats will thus not only be exposed to ideas when they get the opportunity to travel abroad, 
but also benefit from this essential training at home, where former distinguished diplomats will have the right environment to share their knowledge and experience. Some former distinguished diplomats of Ghana, such as the late Ambassador James Agri Oli, the late Ambassador Ramses Cleland Sr., and Ambassador E.M. Devra, who recently passed on, would have been at their best in transferring their considerable talents, experiences, and deep knowledge in diplomacy to the current generation of diplomats. I specifically mention these great men of memory to bring home their extraordinary contribution to the development of Ghana's diplomacy, since they devoted their time tirelessly, even in their very old age, to train and contribute their quota to the development of offices of the ministry. Hence, I can imagine how helpful this facility would have aided them in being at their best. Having said this, I must say that I'm not oblivious to the many great talents this country continues to be blessed with, who equally offer their best to the foreign ministry. I am a firm believer in the transformation that this institute could initiate in our country. From providing our people with top quality training and development, to welcoming international students and scholars from other parts of the world to Ghana through this institute, our aim would be to foster mutual understanding and promote global cooperation. The institutes will prioritize actively and support initiatives that promote cultural exchanges, such as hosting international festivals and exhibitions, so as to hope, help showcase Ghana's rich heritage and strengthen cultural ties with other nations. By nurturing a culture of continuous learning and adaptation within the Foreign Service Institute, we can cultivate diplomats who are not only skilled negotiators but also empathetic listeners, creative problem solvers, and ambassadors of our nation's values. This holistic approach to diplomacy will enable diplomats to navigate complex international relationships with grace and effectiveness, promoting peace and understanding on a global scale. By investing in the development of these well-rounded diplomats, we can ensure that our nation's interests are advanced through respectful dialogue and collaboration. The Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integrations, Honorable Shelley Ayakobotri, in her speech said, the Institute embodies the government's dedication to enhancing excellence in diplomacy as well as Ghana's international relations. It is also aimed at developing top-notch diplomacy and improving Ghana's foreign ties. She also stated that the establishment of the Institute indicates the reinforcement of commitments by the ministry and government to equip diplomats with the necessary knowledge, skills and training to promote peace stability and sustainable development. I am proud to witness this milestone as the Institute embodies the government's dedication to fostering excellence in diplomacy and enhancing Ghana's international relations. With the establishment of this Institute, we reinforce our commitment to equipping our diplomats with the necessary knowledge, skills and training to promote peace, stability and sustainable development. The Foreign Service Institute will play a pivotal role in empowering Ghanaian diplomats to navigate global challenges, build alliances, and foster mutual understanding between Ghana and the world. Together, we shall strengthen Ghana's position on the global stage, championing democracy, human rights, and economic cooperation for a prosperous interconnected and peaceful future. This institute will not only serve Ghanaian foreign service officers, but will also be home to many foreign diplomats 
who would have the opportunity to study at the institute alongside their Ghanaian counterparts. I am confident that this facility will serve as a hub for fostering cross-cultural understanding and collaboration among diplomats from various nations. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I quote, I am convinced more than ever that any society that does not succeed in tapping into the energy and creativity of its youth will be left behind, unquote. These powerful words by our beloved, the late Mr. Kofi Annan, emphasizes the importance of empowering and engaging young minds in shaping the future of our society. As we gather here today to commission this educational institution, we recognize the immense potential that lies within our youth that must be developed. I reckon that through this institute, Great men and women shall be nurtured for Ghana and the international community. This institute will serve as a platform for nurturing young talent, fostering innovation, and cultivating the next generation of leaders and change makers. Together with the relevant public and private national and international institutions, the foreign ministry will seek to unlock the energy and creativity potential of our youth. Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the facilities provided in the building are designed to offer students a thorough and engaging learning experience with the support of modern technology. In taking the optimum advantage of the language and computer laboratories available in this facility, students can hone their language skills. The facility also purposefully provided with student lounges, a VIP lounge, and a spacious cafeteria to promote the culture of interactive engagement, which is an essential part of what diplomats do. The Foreign Service Institute intends to inculcate in Ghanaian diplomats the knowledge and skills required to contribute significantly to the positioning of Ghana at the forefront of global conversation. Chief Director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integrations, Ambassador Ramses J. Cleland, took the opportunity to express the Ministry's deepest appreciation to the President for the projects from its inception to its completion. According to him, the cost of diplomacy should not be counted in spent resources alone, but in the capacity of institutions and well-equipped diplomats to deepen state relations. Indeed, what we are unveiling today is the first phase of, of an important facility for Ghana's foreign service. And we want to take the opportunity to express our deepest appreciation to His Excellency the President for his vision, insight, and personal commitment to this project from its inception to its completion. From his vantage point as Ghana's Foreign Minister several years ago, he did not stop at outlining his vision to place the Foreign Ministry on a high global pedestal he invested time and effort in his quest to lead that transformation. That quest, ably complemented by the untiring efforts of the Honorable Minister in negotiating with relevant partners over the years, has led to the completion of the stage of the project that we are all here to witness. It would be remiss on my part if I did not appreciate the efforts of other officials, ambassadors, especially Ambassador to India at the time, Ambassador Michael Quay Jr., now the CEO of Ghana Free Zones Authority, technical experts and others who, in diverse ways, made their contributions to this institute, thereby bequeathing to us a timeless treasure. History has taught us, and we have seen time and time again, that the cost of diplomacy should not be counted in spent resources alone, but rather in the capacity of age-old institutions and well-equipped diplomats 
to deepen state-to-state -state relations, overcome adversity in all shapes and forms, restore global and regional order, and improve lives in the process. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes vision, and it takes resources. We can and should appreciate the importance to invest in the institutionalization of the machinery of diplomacy at all levels and at all times. It should be a continuous process to invest in talented and well-trained negotiators and diplomats is an endeavor worth every penny spent, an option we cannot leave to future generations. The foreign ministry can assure you that this facility will be equipped and maintained to meet international standards and that it positions itself as a center of excellence in the sub-region and beyond for both Ghanaians and international students for many years to come. We are confident that this institute will play a pivotal role in shaping the future of our diplomatic core and contribute to Ghana's overall development agenda. <laughs>
to carry out activities at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integrations. I'm sure we will be seeing more of her and we'll talk about her first public appearance, which also happened not too long ago on the show. Right, you're still watching Diplomatic Affairs with me, Harriet Nati. Now, let's turn our attention to the situation in Niger, which has become an issue for the entire African continent and the West African region. Heads of governments of the ECOWAS bloc have threatened military action against Niger's Janta after it took part in a coup last week. The leaders are giving the Janta seven days to reinstate President Mohamed Bazoum, who is being held captive. In an interview with international relations analyst Dr. Vladimir Entry Danso, he stressed on effects of the situation in Niger and also is very much worried about the rising instability in the West Africa sub-region of the continent. Thank you so much once again. Prof, West Africa is brewing. West Africa is brewing. Niger is bleeding. Um, let's talk about the increasing coup d'etat on the African continent or West Africa, for instance, Mali, Burkina Faso, and now what, Niger? Well, um, I think it was an inevitability. Um, I predicted this some time back with some of your stations. I was watching what was brewing in Niger and other places, and I said Niger is a candidate. And uh, I'm not thinking that any other flimsy thing will just bring about a coup. But when the necessary and sufficient conditions have been put, there is no amount of witchery or prayers that will stop the tide from unfolding. And that is what we've seen in Niger. The point is, it's not only in Niger. The specific nature of governance in West Africa, the specific nature of problems in West Africa, aridity, um, bad governance, um, ungoverned spaces, and a host of other things create the condition for a seeming state failure. And when you have state failure, the only institution that is capable of forestalling more implosion will be the army or the military. And we saw it in uh, Mali especially. Mali epitomizes what I've said since 2011. Mali is a clear example of state failure where the military intervention it's a positive thing, rather. You know, we saw it in Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. and now we are seeing the same thing in Niger. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, if we don't stem the tide, and let us not measure stemming the tide through the lenses of the so-called democracy and democratic credentials, what can we brew in Africa so that even in our poverty, there is stability? That's my concern. But unfortunately, we believe that lining up people for the ballot and electing a president is democracy and then we, we, we have stopped the bullet. I have always said, and I have this uh, truism, that the ballot does not stop the bullet. Mm. So when you have had the ballot, get the ingredients that go with the ballot and make sure that there is peace and inclusiveness. If we don't have that in West Africa, and I tell you, Mali is a, a recipe for, for other things to follow. I'm watching Senegal and, and Sierra Leone. I'm watching carefully, and I'll, be, I'll not be wrong if tomorrow I, I say there is a possibility of something happening in Senegal and or uh, Sierra Leone, because things are brewing also over there. And, it's, uh, and I think that is when ECOWAS or the regional organization and or AU must step in, preventive measures rather than pre uh, uh, reactive post-ante measures. That, that's my take on that. My concern is that you mentioned Senegal, you mentioned Sierra Leone. Um, how is it that they seem to be so empowered? Because when we look at what happened in Mali, it appears to have empowered Burkina Faso. Then it's also triggered um, Niger, the coup in Niger. They continue to be so emboldened. Is this ever going to come to an end? Democratic backsliding is what is happening because we are not following the democratic tenets properly. That's number one. Number two, we are not taking preventive measures. We are trying to please somebody, especially the West, of our credentials. Uh, elections, yes, check. 
uh, institutions check and all those things and then we say we have a democracy we should be very careful what is happening in Sierra Leone something is brewing because people they have not accepted the results and these are some of the things in democracy democracy itself is very conflictual if America of all people will have to fight over results then you know that we have to do something beyond what the contestations in order to bring about some kind of peace in our democratic dispensations unfortunately the regional bodies are not doing anything prevent the preventive measures they have themselves put in codified kind of protocols are not being followed let's take a case of um, Cote d'Ivoire the constitutionally mandated authority to ensure democracy in Cote d'Ivoire reneged on their mandate and allowed Ouattara to change the constitution and go for a third term. Fine, ECOWAS kept quiet, mm. AU kept quiet. Now, such a thing. And you know, Sa also almost wanted to do that. Uh, uh, that's Senegal, wanted to do that. Makisar. And uh, yes, Makisar, and saw the tide. He has now withdrawn from the third term bid. Mm. But he has started something which has brought about some kind of um, opposition to what he wanted to do. So he's just a hated person. They wanted him out. Now, instead of creating a diplomatic way of resolving issues, he's bringing about a kind of, um, how do I call it, conflict that angers the, the population. And on and on and on, if things go very bad, will it be wrong for the army to save the situation? So these are some of the things that create the condition for, for interventions by the by the military and if you watch out the military coups we are having of late are unlike those we had in the 60s and the 70s why because these are coups that have the total support of the military that is to say the hierarchy in the 60s you can get a sergeant to make a coup you can get a captain to make a coup these days the generals who hold the hierarchy of the militaries are the ones who are making the coup. So I have termed it what I call systemic coups. Coups that save the system. That is ready to reshape the system. In Mali, everything was imploding. There was almost no government because nothing was going on. So they had to step in in order that they don't have a civil war or, you know, all kind of implosions. It's the same thing in Guinea. It was the same thing in Burkina Faso. Now Niger, almost seeing what is happening, just they decided that the general must take over. And incidentally, mark you, it is the presidential guard that started it all. And now all the generals have sworn their allegiance mm. to the head of the presidential guard. Mm. This shows that it's a systemic kind of thing. It is not a conspiratorial some coup. Somebody just wants to be president. No, that's not the case. This is a state kind of stage where they believe that they must salvage the state. Of course, I wouldn't be surprised that, like you are saying, there is a domino effect or there is a influence mm -hmm. emboldened by what has happened in other places. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, the anger against French domination of West African states is also a part of the, a part of the, uh, the reason why I think this is happening. I wouldn't be surprised if the geopolitical systemic order, that is the geopolitical international order, mm -hmm. is part of it. I wouldn't be surprised if the Russians spared them on. We, we are close by, we are in Burkina, we can help you. Mm -hmm. uh, Wagner will come. I, I wouldn't be very surprised because if you see the Russian flags being flow, being uh, hoisted left and right and uh, chanting of uh, down, uh, down with France and uh, hooray Russia. So I wouldn't be surprised because of late, there's a huge international clash between Western values and opposition to that through Russia and China. And therefore, I wouldn't be surprised to see that thing playing in West Africa, that most of these schools will be supported by opposition to Western values in West Africa. Mm -hmm. So these are the realities which we all need to understand before we make comments on what is happening. We just don't have to condemn coups that they, we don't want it, we want to go and intervene and that sort of thing. We need to be very careful because there's a certain wind which is blowing. Do we understand the wind? What are the wind shields that we need to put in place to stop the wind rather than bracing ourselves towards the wind and we are all blown away? That's my advice.
I would want us to talk about ECOWAS, the, how ECOWAS as a regional body has reacted to this particular incident, the coup in Niger. Um, over the weekend, the heads of the West African um, states met to discuss the way forward as to how they can resolve the issue. Is that the way to go for ECOWAS to, you know, threaten Niger with um, a military intervention? Um, if you ask me, and I'll be very blunt, uh, from my background, I hate such interventions generally, because no interventions have proven to solve any problems. And then it's difficult. Post-intervention uh, ripples are also difficult to handle. In the first place, it would be very difficult for ECOWAS to intervene militarily, and they should be very careful. It takes, normally, from research, you will see that it takes not less than six months for mobilization from uh, international organizations. If the UN wants to intervene anywhere, it takes long, six months minimum, at times nine months. Why? Because troop contributing countries will have to give their troops. They fund their own troops and logistics and everything, campaign planning, logistics, and again, mandates. So what mandate are we going to give our people who are going to go to Niger? That's number one. Who is going to fund it? If it is funded from outside, it's worse. Let us assume that it is known that France is going to fund the ECOWAS operations. I tell you, that will not be the end of it. France will be hated forever. So ECOWAS should have at least started some kind of diplomatic moves. The thing has happened already. Once it has happened, how do we cool things before we see what way to intervene? In conflict, we say, if you have not mapped the conflict, don't enter. So conflict mapping, you map it. What has happened? Who are, in, who are the interested parties? Who are the belligerents? Who is behind who? And which way? Which, which are the contours of the conflict? And where do I enter from? Now you send an army. Let us assume Nigerian army is a very strong army. They can go in. But Nigeria has its own problem just close by. So supposing Nigeria is able to quell the, uh, the insurrection in uh, uh, Niger, on their way back, they also have problems with their own country. Let us not try to have a boomerang, you know. I believe that what ECOWAS should have done is to send uh, the panel of the wise, which we have, you know, that is our own protocol allows us to go in. Or even use track two interventions. Track two interventions are prominent person. I hear the uh, Sultan of Sokoto has offered to mediate. Such persons, you can use them because the tribes cut across the lines. And he may be of influence to let the junta understand, and we make a, a preparations towards some coalition that will bring up, that will douse the fire and a smooth transition. But when we say we are going to fight, I'm afraid two things. One, if we are unable to go, we are emboldening the, the, the junta. And it's, there's a history to it. We threatened Burundi with all kinds of things. That is AU. AU said a contingent of more than 6,500 was going to land in Burundi. We couldn't go. And it emboldened the man, and he started killing more people. That's what I'm afraid of. That if you bluff, I'll beat you, I'll beat you, and then I stand firm and I say, if you like, come. And we, we start fighting. You see, maybe I'm stronger. So that is one thing ECOWAS must be very careful with. And if we fail in that, it means we will fail in future ones altogether. We threatened Mali. We threatened Guinea, we threatened Burkina, we didn't. We are not threatening Niger, and I'm not happy with it. I'm not very happy at all with it. Secondly, as I've said, the, there are similarities with all our problems that yield coups. So if this intervention doesn't succeed, the multiplicity of coups we are going to see on the subcontinent will be anybody's guess. So we should be very careful the way we have started. And if we go and bodies are being brought to nigeria to ghana to guinea i don't know which countries will contribute the troops if bodies start coming the militaries in these countries are also not stupid so we should be very very i'm scared and i'm praying that it doesn't work i'm told that the chief of defense staffs of the various countries are meeting today or tomorrow in abuja we pray they are the military men so they understand it better i pray that they go and say please let us use the diplomatic means rather than, so let, let us advise the politicians to use diplomacy. You use uh, our CDS, for example, to go and talk to his counterpart 
in, in Niger and talk jaw jaw. Say, look, military intervention is not good. So let's do it this way. I believe in diplomacy more than this threat of the kinetic approach to 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 uh, such interventions. Diplomacy must work. Um, Prof, um, this is a very dicey situation. I would want to find out from you, since you mentioned Western influence, you talked about um, other Western countries meddling in the affairs of the continent. Uh, let's talk about, you talk about Wagner, for instance, um, see, which seems to be, um, you know, somehow supporting what is happening by asking the people, you know what, get France out so we can come in and then we can help you. Are we trading one colonizer for the other? I don't think this colonialism. Two things. One, Russia and Wagner will be so happy to oust the West from West Africa. It's part of the global geopolitics. Just like America would go to Iraq or want Gaddafi out because Gaddafi, yes. So it's part of the global geopolitics which will not end. So one will be laughing when the other is in trouble. And you know, the second thing is that French, French uh, domination, French uh, neocolonialism has now been exposed. And almost all the French speaking countries in Africa are so angry with France. You know, uh, Macron tried to recalibrate, came back and wanting, but the harm is too much. If you have films about what they did to Algeria, what they did to Vietnam, you know, you would you, you hate the French. You really would hate them. What they did to uh, Congo and other places. And now, since then, they have not gone out. And it's like they're forcing French-speaking countries to do their bidding against Russia and China and take it or leave it, kind of. This is a power struggle kind of issue then. Yes, yes serious power struggle. So when on the horizon, Somebody is appearing like China and Russia. China coming with that kind of soft approach to international politics, you know, and Russia coming in with some brutal force to say, I can help you build your militaries. I can help you chase the terrorists away. Of course, look at Rwanda. Rwanda was so angry that it changed French as the lingua franca for Rwanda into English and left the Francophonie and joined the Commonwealth. This is a very serious thing against France. Now, Mali is almost doing the same thing. France, out, out of here. And I hear there, is a, there are calls by the ordinary citizens to use English. And France, Fr French, France must now be thinking. Already, Guinea is not on talking terms with France since independence. And that has been the bane. It has been the problem with Guinea. You know. Then Burkina. Burkina is embracing Wagner all over. The flags are all over in Burkina. So France must be thinking seriously. And France is left on, on its own to do what they like in Africa because Germany doesn't want to come in. America doesn't want to come in. They hide behind them. Germany was going to spend $500 million uh, in building schools, hospitals, and you know, that soft approach to international relations. In Niger, they said they are halting that. America is there. They have a drone um, base. Mm -hmm. And France is there. They have a full base, and they are withdrawing them now. They have a full base, plus mining uh, the uranium. And you know, uranium is a big base. Look at France is lit with light industries left and right. Mm -hmm. and, and Niger is so poor, even though the base for the industrialization is Nigerian uh, uranium. So all these things create the conditions for rethinking relationship with France or the West. And that is what is happening. All right, then. Thank you so much, Prof, for your time, as always. Um, where do we go from here? If diplomacy fails, where do we go from here? Uh, normally, we say if diplomacy fails, war is the ultimate. But unfortunately, war cannot be a continuation of diplomacy. Diplomacy is unending. And I believe the Nigerian situation can be handled through diplomacy. I strongly believe. Send strong people. Take somebody like Ibn Chambers, one of the best diplomats the world has ever produced. And he has been uh, head of UNOWA before, you know, the UN uh, this office in West Africa. If you take uh, Chambers and you add very prominent persons, you know, and you ask them to go to Niger to negotiate transition. First, they should negotiate the release of the president. 
the negotiate transition, which is acceptable to the junta, to the people of Niger, and to the tribal. See, Niger is more ruled by the tribal heads. Put them together and have a transition which will lead to a, con to a constitutional order. An order which I think is not French-based, has nothing to do with Western known democracy. When people talk about democracy, I, I get worried because they always equate democracy to Western democracy. For me, if my democracy means that I must have a king, like say the Santihini is the king of Ghana, and we draw rules and regulations towards our kingship, that is our democracy because we have codified how we want to be ruled. Unfortunately, we want to see our democracy in brewed in the western port and that is part of the problem we have in ghana the hiccups the political uh, chickenery and all those things we are having is precisely because of the importation of our democracy we have mixed or merged westminster type of democracy british and american presidential system and that homophrodite way of going doing about is not working in ghana at one point, we are blaming the president of having too much power. But we put it in the constitution. At another point, if anything happens, we want the president to talk. Somebody is killed in Takuradi. Hey, why is the president not talking? You know, kind of. Another thing, they say, hey, why is the president not doing this? Or that kind of thing. But if we have our own constitution brewed in the Ghanaian port, then we know it is our kukunte we are eating and not omelet. That's my, my take on this. Thank you so much. Right, so yes, we've had the experts' opinion on this particular incident, Niger, and what is happening in the West African region. And it is an issue of concern to all of us, the region, and of course the entire continent. So we have been able to speak with the experts, Professor Vladimir Inchi Danso. Thank you so much for, for your time. Um, we're still watching Diplomatic Affairs. I will be back right after this break. Trasaco Estates, home to Accra's most beautiful and luxurious homes, presents its newest addition, Trasaco Springs, a premium master planned community of service plots surrounded by an exhaustive list of amenities. The gated community of Tema to Accra Motorway presents you the finest opportunity to own a land that suits your preferred size budget and payment terms. Trasaco Springs is open to you for development. Our on-site sales executives are ready. Call. You're still watching Diplomatic Affairs. Now let me take you all the way to the residence of the Ambassador of Morocco to Ghana, Her Excellency. Iman Wadil. Um, the Moroccan ambassador, the Moroccan embassy in Ghana has celebrated the 24th anniversary of King Mohammed VI since his ascension to the throne with a call on Africa to have faith in Africa to achieve development and prosperity for the continent. Speaking at this special event, the Moroccan ambassador to Ghana, Her Excellency Ambassador Iman Wadil said, the commemoration of the throne day is a celebration of the long-standing tradition of the act of allegiance and a unique tribute to the millennial attachments between the king and the people representing the unity of the nation and the state as well as the belief of the people in a bright future in dignity prosperity peace and security it was a very very beautiful celebration it had the presence of the diplomatic community and it also saw traditional leaders um, government officials and friends of the embassy right here in accra Increasingly, 
collaborating on emerging issues such as food security, infrastructure, education, and training. On food security, with a view to boosting South-South cooperation, Morocco's phosphate giant, OCP Group, and Ghana's government have completed in May this year the initial studies for the construction of a $1.3 billion fertilizer complex in Takoradi. The project aims to help increase fertilizer availability in Ghana, as well as reduce input costs for farmers. Earlier this month, the Minister of Food and Agriculture, Honorable Brian Ashiampong, has met with his Moroccan counterpart, Mohamed Sadiqi, to further consolidate Morocco-Ghana bilateral cooperation in the agricultural sector and water resource management, notably through the exchange of best practices. Minister Sadiqi, who is also in charge of fisheries, has also met this year the Honorable Mavis Hawa Kumson to discuss ways and means to take advantage of the enormous opportunities in all segments of the fisheries and agriculture value chain in Ghana and Morocco. On the energy level, Morocco and the Federal Republic of Nigeria are working on the completion of a gas pipeline between the two countries that passes through a group of countries including Ghana. It is an ambitious initiative to value the capabilities of African resource to reshape the regional energy map, enhance the logistical and competitive capabilities of African gas, and strengthen its position in the European market. This strategic project will contribute to Africa's development, improve living conditions for its people, further integrate economies of the sub-region and the African continent, and give Africa a new economic, political, and strategic dimension. Moroccan investments in Ghana have also grown considerably during the last decades. In the finance sector with the presence of Bank of Africa, in construction and real estate with CIMAF and its sister company, at Doha, and in retail and in, with the Traft Afrique and Kitea, who joined in March 2023. To pave the way for greater collaboration and exchange, Ghana and Morocco have consolidated their legal framework of cooperation by ratifying in October 2022 the agreement for the avoidance of double taxation and prevention of fiscal evasion. We also work at the embassy to encourage Ghanaian investors to explore the many opportunities offered by Morocco and take advantage of the many facilities provided within the AFCFTA framework. We in Morocco believe that Africa should learn to have faith in Africa. On peace and religious coexistence and security, I am satisfied that the Ghana branch of the Mohammed VI Foundation of Africa and Ulema is working hard towards the objective of pooling and coordinating the efforts of Muslim religious leaders from Morocco and Ghana to shed light and promote the tolerant values of Islam. Morocco and Ghana are also large contributors in the international efforts of peacekeeping across Africa and both participate in training exercises such as African Lion and Flint Love. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, if relationships between countries are indeed based on common interests and common values, they are mainly nurtured by the people, the bridge builders. I want to applaud my fellow Moroccans in Ghana for their active participation in the reinforcing of our bilateral relations. Your love for your homeland and your attachment to our eternal motto, God, Homeland, King, is commendable. I urge you all to continue promoting Morocco in all spheres of your life. I would also like to pay tribute to the Ghana Morocco All Students Association, to its president and members for being great ambassadors of Morocco to Ghana. I am happy that their number continue to increase through the yearly 90 scholarship provided by the Moroccan Agency for International Cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, this year has been emotionally intense for us, especially as we followed with great joy and elation the outstanding performance of the Atlas Lions at the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, where they have succeeded with the brilliance and merit to reach the, semi the semifinals, the first and the most resounding achievement of the kind of Moroccan, African, and Arab soccer. I would post to warmly thank our Ghanaian friends and I'm happy that the Minister of Sports is here with us tonight for their support during the competition and beyond. The Kingdom of Morocco has decided together with Spain and Portugal to present a joint bid to host the 2030 World Cup. This joint bid, which is unprecedented in football history, 
will bring together Africa and Europe, and we hope to get the needed support of Ghana for it. Before closing, allow me to thank my colleagues at the embassy and at the residence for their continuous efforts. My gratitude and love go to my family, to my spouse, Kamal, and to my daughters, Rita, Yasmina, and Kenza, for standing always by me. Long live Morocco and Ghana, and may our countries continue to prosper and grow together in respect and harmony. Let me take this opportunity to commend the King's commitment and leading role in promoting the South-South cooperation and solidarity across African continent. His contribution on promoting togetherness among African countries, relations between the two countries have uh, been strengthened through a wide range of programs of technical assistance and political cooperation. Morocco's biggest real estate company, Adoha Group, which has an annual turnover of close to one billion, is currently investing in our housing sector. The group has already signed a memorandum of understanding with the government of Ghana to construct a 10,000 housing unit over seven years, valued at 250 million euros. Other Moroccan business operators who have set up operations in Ghana include the Bank of Africa, which set up operations in 2015 with over 33 branches and then produces over 1 million tons of cement per annum, as well as a paper factory to produce cement bags. Additionally, OCP Group, the Moroccan State Phosphate Company, set up fertilizer company and the seven fertilizer blending sites across Ghana. It also set up the OCP Foundation, which undertakes many activities in Ghana, including helping farmers with free fertilizer and soil mapping of their farmlands. Others include GAIC Energy, Wind Power Generating Company, which aims to produce electricity to the national grid, and employment generation for Africans teeming youth, among other expectations, and hope that same are actualized for the benefit of all of Africa. Finally, Your Excellency, let me see this opportunity to thank you again for your effort and promoting and strengthening the good relationships that exist between our two countries. I wish to assure you that Ghana would continue to corroborate with the Kingdom of Morocco at all levels. All too soon, this is where we draw the curtain for today's production of Diplomatic Affairs. My name is Harriet Nati. I look forward to seeing you same time next week. Enjoy the rest of our programs. African.